Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about career progression in archaeology. The reason I want to talk about this is to give people a bit more of an idea of the different career pathways that you could have as an archaeologist within an archaeological company in the UK. And I've talked about some of these roles and careers before, but I want to go into a little bit more detail about the specific roles themselves. In terms of how much money these different people make and their salaries, you can refer back to my last video where I talked about how much archaeologists actually make. Calling yourself an archaeologist is kind of a blanket term. There's a lot of different people that do a lot of different roles that you might not traditionally associate with being an archaeologist, but they can still call themselves that. And being an archaeologist doesn't just mean that you're spending your whole life digging until you're essentially digging your own grave. <laughs> digging, while kind of the essential component that brings us all together, is not something that people necessarily want to do all the time for their whole career throughout their lives. And this can be for a variety of reasons, which I have, again, touched on before. Sorry about the lighting, I try to use natural sunlight and the sun is just peeking behind some clouds right now in Edinburgh. So reasons that people might not necessarily want to be a digger for their entire career are things like family. I've talked about this a lot before where, you know, being a digger essentially means you have to travel a lot and that's not really great if you have young children or perhaps like a mortgage and you actually want to live where you're paying to live, so on and so forth. Injuries is another thing that happens. <laughs> you know, people's knees tend to give out after a while or other parts of your body that are involved with the physical labor of archaeology. So, you know, um, your like elbows and shoulders from all the lifting. And then as well, some people just get tired of the whole lifestyle, tired of digging, kind of move up the ladder and do other things. So the stuff that I'm going to be talking about I'm today, I'm going to be using as generic terms as possible, stuff that I've come across, but these aren't always going to be exactly what's used company to company, just so you're aware. So first off, the most typical example that people think of when they think of a, an archaeologist is somebody who is doing field work. And within different companies, they'll call that department different things. I've contracting, general works, the field staff. And within that, there is a whole structure as you move up the ladder of the different things that you do. Generally, everyone starts off, if they haven't already begun as a trainee, as a site assistant. This can also be called a project archaeologist, a field technician if you're in Canada, a field archaeologist, what have you. And this is the lowest rung on the proverbial archaeology ladder. This is kind of the phase that we would associate with paying our dues. So you're traveling a lot, you're doing hard work, you're doing lots of physical labor, you're learning your craft, you're getting experience. You, so you'll be traveling a lot, usually you'll be on you know sites of all kinds of different periods, different cultures, depending on where you're working in the UK, you'll be in different locations. So there's a lot of variety to give you kind of like a very wide band of experience that you can later pull from. And it'll also give you experience of lots of different project types, so like that evaluations, excavations, and potentially also introduce you to the other aspects in the office where you're doing a data entry, maybe contributing to reports. The majority of site assistants in the UK are on temporary contracts, so they are contracted for the duration of a project, and then some companies try to find work for them in the office afterwards, some companies can't give them work afterwards, and there are companies that do employ permanent site assistants. However, these people can still be let go if the company no longer has work for them. So everyone usually will start out doing this job, then quite a lot of people will move on and move up the ladder, but there are also people that just really enjoy digging, so they end up doing it for their entire life and they just follow a project around the country. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, those people can be a real asset on, on sites, but you know, it's just kind of what each person prefers to do. Once you have been a site assistant for a couple of years and you have a relatively good grasp on archaeological strategy and methodology and you can kind of walk onto a site and be fairly confident and know what you're doing with little to minimum direction, you can start looking at jobs as a supervisor also known as a project supervisor or like a team supervisor or something with supervisor in it. You might be in charge of like a small team of people or say you're on a project that has multiple sites on it, you might be in charge of one site with one team of people. And this is where you start to get more responsibility. Generally to get this job you're definitely going to need 
a couple years of experience and a driver's license. These jobs can sometimes, they can be temporary contracts, again, for the duration of a project, or sometimes they can be permanent. Similar to a site assistant, they are more likely to be permanent than a site assistant job, but that's not actually guaranteed. The kind of stuff that you'll be doing as a supervisor is checking people's paperwork to make sure that they filled everything out correctly and legibly, and mentoring and teaching people new to the profession how to do their job correctly, supervising small teams of people. As well, you can be asked to watch machines as they're stripping the topsoil. And sometimes you might get left on your own, but a lot of the larger companies, you'll still get more support from a more senior staff member uh, on site because this is where they start to train you to be a manager supervisor. And the thing in archaeology that happens a lot of the times is that the people who are the best diggers, people who become supervisors, and this is not necessarily the best way to do it because just because you're a good digger doesn't mean that you're very good at managing or supervising people which is really the skill that you need as a supervisor and uh, being a supervisor involves a lot more than just understanding and interpreting the archaeology once you start moving up the ladder it becomes a lot more about managing and supervising people and projects and stuff like that next on the ladder we have a project officer which is also somewhat interchangeable and very similar to someone who's called a senior archaeologist depending on where you're working a senior archaeologist is kind of above a project officer but uh, not every company uses this role but they are sometimes used to differentiate between somebody who is has been doing project officer stuff for a very long time, but they're not re necessarily ready to be a project manager yet. From a supervisor into a PO, wh which is what they're usually called, you move from kind of like running and supervising small teams of people or small sites to running a site. You still have a project manager to answer to, but you generally in the field on the day-to-day -day, are the person who's in charge. This means that more often than not you're the person or the that is going to be dealing directly with the contractor that's on site, all the admins surrounding your staffs, making sure that, you know, staff are briefed in there and you have enough of them, that you have like proper site facilities, that timesheets are getting submitted. You'll likely be the, one of the people going to the meetings with contractors to see what's going on in the overall project. You're probably going to end up being the person that has to give site tours. So people from the project show up and they want to see what's going on. You're going to be the person showing them around, talking about the interpretation, what you think is going on. This is also usually the phase where you start to get sent out to do stuff by yourself. And by that I mean and you have no other team. So these are the people that get sent out to watch machines in the middle of nowhere that are digging cable routes or roads or whatever, and they're trusted enough that they can recognize archaeology in the ground, they can deal with stuff without needing another person to kind of help them tell them what to do. And this tends to often get quoted as being something that's a bit of a trial by fire. And <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories of people who've arrived out in the middle of nowhere and just been like, ah, I don't know what's going on! But the people who persevere through that obviously make the best project officers. These people will almost always have a permanent contract at a company and so they can be employed year round even when there's not field work going on. This means that once the field work has finished and they've had to let the other staff go, this person goes back into the office and they write up the report and they have enough work to do back at the office to keep them employed until the next project starts. When they're in the field, like I said, they spend a lot more time doing kind of like admin things than actually digging, <laughs> which is something that can obviously be frustrating if you really enjoy digging. There is definitely this trend where if you're a PO and you're trying to dig a feature on site, generally what happens is you get about 20 minutes of work done and then somebody comes up to you and has a problem that you have to fix, or someone's arrived on site to do an inspection, or you need to talk to the project manager about this, and it takes them a lot longer to get something done because they are the go-to person on site. And then the next step up the ladder is someone who's called a project manager. And so this person is usually almost solely office based. They will make trips to site to make sure that everything is going okay and to like attend meetings and see if there's any problems. But most of their time is spent at a desk. And they are the people who run projects. So this isn't just the site and the archaeology, it's everything else that's surrounding it that makes it a project. 
They usually will be the ones who are tendering and bidding to get those projects for a company. And their part in running the project means not just helping with interpreting the archaeology and seeing what's going on. It means that they have to be the person that organizes all the logistics of everything. So, you know, you need a machine to strip the topsoil, but you also need a dumper to take it away. You need to make sure that they have enough fuel. You need to make sure that there's a welfare, that the welfare gets cleaned and fueled every day. You need to make sure that you have enough staff. You need to make sure that you have enough supervisors. You need to make sure that you have enough equipment. And some of this stuff can obviously be delegated to uh, POs and supervisors who are going to help on a project, but the project manager is the one who makes sure that everything that needs to get done gets done. And they'll be the one who is most often directly liaising with the client, the curator, or the consultant to make sure that everything is going according to plan. They are the ultimate people who are responsible for dealing with any problems that come up on a site. And they'll be the one who finally authorizes and signs off a report once a project's been finished. And this can usually be kind of the top tier of people who would call themselves like a full-on archaeologist. Now it's not to say that you can't move on from a project manager into a higher position like um, people that end up eventually running companies but there are quite a few people that will stay at a project manager for a longer period of time. And obviously out of the four roles that I've just discussed, they are the ones that are the highest paid. Now, all these roles that I've just discussed are a bit fluid and they change between companies. So, you know, sometimes supervisors at one company might have more responsibilities than they would at another company. They might have different requirements, all that kind of stuff. But generally what I've just spoken about is how most companies tend to structure things. I would say it's a kind of, it's a beneficial system. I'd have a hard time thinking of something that would work better because like I, I've said so many times before, archaeology and your expertise at archaeology really depends on experience, which is something that only comes with time. And in this system, it allows you to gain that experience while you're still theoretically young and fit and able to carry out more the more physically laborious work and then as you get older and if you show the aptitude you can transition into something that's a bit more stable steady and less physically demanding as your body starts to say what are you doing i don't want to shovel any all day anymore obviously being involved in field work is something that most people aspire to do or is what most people think of an archaeologist doing but there are roles outside of that that support a project that a lot of companies have. People can sometimes go straight into these jobs depending on their experience. Sorry, I just had to draw the blind because the, the sunspot here was uh, really throwing off my lighting. <laughs> okay, specialists. So people can go straight into being specialisms if they're in a right time, right place kind of situation right after they graduate from whatever program and they have the right qualifications to be a specialist. Other people generally will tend to work as a site assistant on the circuit for a couple years and gain some first-hand field experience. And then as the company kind of figures out, okay, we want to try and keep you around, they'll start to ask you a bit more about what your specialties are, what kind of extra stuff you might be able to help out with or do, and then they'll maybe try to train you up and transition you into that if, if they feel like you would be a good fit. So what kind of specialism or what kind of other jobs outside of field work are there at an archaeological company? There's people who do consultancy, which is another kind of type of field work, but it's not so digging intensive. People who work in consultancy tend to work with clients before the actual excavation starts. So they kind of tell them, okay, so we anticipate that you are going to have this condition placed upon your planning application, or it's likely that you're gonna come across stuff here. And that just means that uh, they're much more office-based and research-based. So they prepare things called desk-based assessments. So they try and predict the likelihood of heritage that's gonna appear based on maps and other digs that have been in the vicinity. We'll also do stuff like walkovers where they walk across, you know, large amounts of land and take pictures of stuff that they think could potentially be flagged as a heritage asset that needs to be taken care of, so on and so forth. Another specialist specialist thing that people might not necessarily think of right away is people who are illustrators so people who have training in graphic design uh, or AutoCAD and other like GIS tech systems they'll do stuff like drawing fines or uh, doing illustrations for publications they'll do like fines photography again for publication the company that I work for our graphics team also like they design all of our internal posters they do all of our typesetting for reports, like it's quite a wide variety of things that they tend to do. Quite a lot of archaeological companies will also employ fine specialists. 
So these people will generally probably have like a master's in either like artifact conservation or museum studies or perhaps a particular type of artifact like you know prehistoric pottery or Roman pottery. The amount of education that they have will vary but they will have a specialism in some type of archaeological find. Find specialists a lot of the time what it involves for them doing is they will either be the person who's cleaning up the finds and then you know seeing how many of them do we have, what type, entering it into a database, assessing everything, rebagging it, and then if they are dealing with something that falls within their specialism they will do the analysis to write into a report of what finds are there. They might also end up doing stuff like conservation of artifacts, um, doing archiving, sending things away to whatever museum it needs to go to, all that kind of stuff. Environmentalists are very similar to fine specialists. They have a specialty in environmental archaeology, so stuff like paleoecology or paleobotany, and they will be the ones who are looking after the environmental samples. So what samples need to be taken is usually written into the WSI for a project, slash if you come across a deposit that you think is going to be really rich in organic material, charcoal being the most popular. If you're finding a lot of charcoal, it's generally an indicator that you need to be taking a sample. Just had to close the other blinds so that the sun wouldn't be shining on my face. <laughs> What an environmental person will do is processing the samples using like a wet sieving processing system and then they go through the retent and the flot, all the stuff that comes out of this system and then again they write that to go into a report that will go into the overall interpretation of the site. Increasingly popular, I guess, department in a lot of archaeological companies nowadays are people who do stuff associated with like um, geophysics and surveying techniques. So using GPS and robotic total stations and other geophysical systems and then taking the data off of them and, and mocking them up in fancy computer programs. Obviously this is something that requires uh, a bit more expertise in terms of computers and computer systems and those people are becoming increasingly valuable to companies as being able to use that kind of technology is becoming cheaper and more economical. All of these roles can be similar in structure to how I described the fieldwork stuff. So for example within fines you can have someone who's a fines assistant so they might do all the washing of the pottery and then rebagging after it's dried out. And then you'll have someone who is maybe a fine supervisor who's in charge of doing all the weighing of the pottery and sorting it out so that everything is properly categorized. And then you'll have somebody who's a fines officer who will again be doing fines analysis. And then you'll have someone who's a fines manager who oversees the department and you know assigns projects and does all that kind of stuff. You can have upwards progression throughout all of these different specialisms as well as within fieldwork. There's also um, one other department that some archaeological companies will have and some don't. This usually depends on whether or not you are an archaeological company that's also technically a charity and these are people that we call community archaeologists. So they will mostly focus on community-based projects that are you know funded by grants and are staffed usually almost entirely by volunteers and they are more for outreach and public community stuff but again it depends on what company you work for. Companies that aren't run as charities and are run as businesses can't really afford to take on projects that aren't necessarily going to make them as much money as a commercial archaeology project run by a developer. So those are all kind of the people within a company who can kind of fit under the broad umbrella term as calling themselves an archaeologist. But obviously they aren't the only thing that makes a company successful and well run. If you are running a company, I would generally recommend that you at least have someone to deal with all the admin, kind of receptionist kind of roles, and making sure that an office is running smoothly. You need to have an HR department, you need to have somebody that's doing finance. Sometimes these roles are filled by people that are actual, you know, receptionists or HR managers, but they can also sometimes be roles that are filled by archaeologists. And this generally happens when there is maybe an, you have an interest in something like finance or HR or the company needs that role to be filled but for whatever reason instead of hiring someone who has a degree in HR they just decide to train up one of their senior archaeologists to do it instead. And this can both be a benefit in that an archaeologist who's trained in HR is very intimately acquainted with archaeological problems within HR but 
they also haven't spent their entire career and degree training in how to deal with HR associated stuff. So it can be a bit of a mixed bag depending on where you work. So this has been as brief as I can do an overview of the different roles that people can have within an archaeological company, especially if you perhaps aren't keen on digging for the rest of your life. Although I will say as somebody who transitioned from a fieldwork role into a mostly non-fieldwork role, I do miss it. <laughs> I was begging my company for a long time to send me out on a project just so I could kind of feel connected back to what I was originally fell in love with with archaeology which was the digging and I luckily got to just spend the past two weeks just being a site assistant out in the field just digging stuff up and I was quite happy to do that. But yeah, that's kind of the way it works. Obviously, bigger companies that employ more people will have more roles for people to fill. They will have one person for specific roles. Although a lot of the time what you come across is someone who fills a variety of roles. So say that you spend most of your time doing site assistant stuff, but once there's no work left in the field and you're in the office, you then do data entry and the data entry runs out. So then they maybe have you doing finds assistant stuff. Maybe they have you doing uh, processing all the environmental samples. So people can tend to have multiple roles across the company, which is good because it also means that they want to keep you around. And it all has to do with this idea of they need to be able to provide you with work that is most of the time bringing money into the company through a contract. So they need to be able to justify that you are going to be able to do that role you know 365 days a year and they're going to have enough work for you to fulfill to do that role most of the year before they will offer it to you as something that you're going to be doing all the time. That's my very brief overview of uh, a bunch of the different roles that you can have in a commercial archaeology company. I'm sure there's stuff that I, I've missed but I, and I've kind of based this upon the place that I currently work and the other places that I've worked as well. But generally the structure is overall the same at most companies because it is what works. If you have any questions as per usual, put them down in the comments section below. If you want to find out a bit more about how much all these different people get paid, especially within the field, check out my video on how much archaeologists make. If you'd like, I have my social media down below and you can feel free to follow me on there. And as well, I do have planned to review the newest Tomb Raider game, but I have a couple obstacles in my way before I can get that up for you guys. The first one being the fact that it costs like 40 pounds, uh, which is, I'm sorry, expensive. I, I don't make that much money that I can just drop that. <laughs> Uh, right as soon as something comes out so I might have to wait till there's some used copies out there as well I want to try and figure out a setup so that I can do it like the gamer channels where I you have a video of me while I'm playing the game alongside a video of what is actually happening in the game so I need to figure out how I'm going to do that setup for the least amount of money and technology as possible <laughs> If you have any tips for how I can achieve that, please again put them down below. <laughs> Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!